Um, so next we will have um, a bit of a kind of mixed media, not well, mixed media um, session. It will involve um, a participant here and also on Zoom as well as some video presentation. So um, I'll introduce both Anna Bowstead and Suzanne Thompson, and then we'll get stuck in. So Anna Bowstead is the coordinator for the Indigenous Carbon Industry Network. Um, Anna is an environmental communications and policy spe specialist based in Darwin, Larrakia country, with 18 years experience in the Indigenous land management and community environment sector, including roles with NALSMA, Environment Centre NT, Environment Victoria, and Landcare NT. Through these roles, Anna has worked to support many different community organisations and Indigenous groups to promote their important work caring for country and advocate for better policies in the areas of Indigenous water policy, economic development, climate change, and environmental management. She is particularly passionate about supporting greater recognition of the incredible expertise held by the traditional owners of Australia, including the hard work by Indigenous land managers to manage their country and support Indigenous-led economic development. This brought Anna to her most recent role as coordinator of the Indigenous Carbon Industry Network, supporting knowledge sharing and networking across Indigenous organisations engaged in the carbon industry. Anna holds a Master's in Tropical Environmental Management and a Bachelor of Arts, Eco Communication. In 2009, as a part of her Master's research, Anna co-authored a report with Professor Pascal Tremblay assessing the potential impact of climate change upon tourism in Kakadu National Park. Anna has also passion for music. She's played a few jams so far, uh, which were great, and storytelling, and is a published singer-songwriter with local band After the Rain. Great, she's on her way. She she missed, her, she missed her introduction, but that's right. We can. It was for us anyway. <laughs> so Suzanne Thompson, um, Inungai, uh, CEO of the uh, Yambanku Aboriginal Cultural Heritage and Tourism Development Aboriginal Corporation. Suzanne was born and raised in Bar Barkaldine. Her custodial connection to country has been continuous and carries on the work of her, of her father, the late David Thompson. Great grandparents, David and Clara, all of which had traditional custodial links to the lands of the Kungri, Inangai, and Bidjara peoples. Suzanne has returned to country after two decades of working within government agencies and private business enterprises. For the most part, she has worked in the areas of youth and policy development, community development, indigenous, indigenous business advisor, volunteering commitments, board member of the um, Queensland Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Legal Services Board, Noosa Biosphere Board, Committee Member for the Desert Uplands Committee, Founding Member of the Ubuntu Aboriginal Cultural Heritage and Tourism Development Aboriginal Corporation. Suzanne is a National Co-Chair for the Statement from the Heart Working Group and sits on the QTIC First Nations Tourism Plan Working Group. She also, on top of all that, um, owns and manages her own gallery with her husband and runs a successful wood-fired pizza business called The Lounging Emu. <clears throat> Suzanne sees these enterprises as a key opportunity to share the stories of her ancestral knowledge and practices to the tourists and locals. She's teamed up with land hold, landowners of the district to work in partnership to further develop relationships with both indigenous and non-indigenous peoples. She is passionate about the opportunities that both, both cultures can create into the future as new industries for outback communities. <clears throat> so I'll get Anna Bowser up here. Oh, there she is. And Suzanne will be on Zoom. Oh, there she is. Got everyone's here and take it away. Uh, thank you, Jara, um, for the introduction. And um, thank you, Suzanne, for joining us online today. Uh, we can see you on the big screen. Um, just to let you know, because um, sometimes that happens and people don't tell you. So just to let you know. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, so I'd just like to start by um, uh, once again, paying my respects to the Aranda traditional owners of this country and uh, just say how um, privileged I feel to, to be back here in this place, um, which has a, occupies a particularly special place in my heart. Um, and 
uh, also just to pay respects to all the traditional owners in the room and um, uh, and also um, uh, just pay uh, pay my respects to uh, Mr. the memory of Mr. Rioli, um, who unfortunately left us uh, um, uh, two months ago too soon, and he was the founding director of um, a founding director of the Indigenous Carbon Industry Network. Um, so um, he uh, was a Tiwi Munapi man from Tiwi Islands. Um, and shortly I'll show you a video that talks a little bit about the network. I've decided not to present a PowerPoint presentation today because there has um, been a lot of PowerPoint presentations. Um, so I thought I'd just um, say a few words about the Indigenous Carbon Industry Network, um, which evolved in 2018 um, out of the North Australia Savannah Fire Forum um, and is a network of around 35 Indigenous organisations across um, predominantly North Australia, but also now across all of Australia, who uh, own projects, carbon projects. So um, full members are Indigenous organisations that own or directly produce carbon credits. And then we also have associate members who are Indigenous organisations who have an interest in carbon industry, but don't yet have their own carbon project. The network was formed in recognition of the um, that there was a gap in terms of coordinating um, in the sharing of information and discussions and forums with between Indigenous organisations um, that have a lot of experience in, in uh, developing uh, their own carbon projects. Um, the very first Indigenous owned carbon project was the West Arnhem Land Fire Abatement Project, which predates the Emissions Reduction Fund. So um, this industry in a lot of ways was created by traditional owners themselves. And the Savannah fire management methods that um, underpin around, you know, around 90% of the indigenous owned projects, um, they were written in recognition of the traditional knowledge of fire management that, um, that um, traditional owners have and, and to redress um, very hot fires that were sweeping across the landscape in absence of of any um, direct management by uh, Aboriginal people. So, um, so those methods, the very first project was actually registered in 2006 um, with, and then Wadaka Land Management really taken the lead in that space. And our co-chair, Dean Barbuk, is also the chair of, of Wadaka Land Management. Uh, he sends his apologies. He couldn't be here today um, as he also as a prior commitment and um, as does Tara Gromala, um, who I was hoping could join me up, uh, on the guitar, who's also a musician. Um, he, he said he'd love to be here, but um, he also has a prior commitment. So um, the network hosts two uh, events, national events, the North Australia Savannah Fire Forum, which is held every February in Darwin and the National Indigenous Calm Forum, which will be held first face-to-face -face for the very first time um, next year in April um, in Queensland. Uh, so that the we play a role in, in facilitating knowledge sharing, as I mentioned earlier, um, with, uh, together with member organisations, we've designed free prior informed consent guidelines that um, are really seeking to uh, seek better recognition of Indigenous rights and interests in carbon, um, because in the other carbon methods um, that weren't, that weren't uh, necessarily developed by traditional owners, um, there has been a rush on carbon projects around Australia. And, um, and surprisingly, there's only four Indigenous-owned carbon projects outside of the Savannah Fire Management. One of those is, um, is the Yachidak. Um, project that Suzanne will talk about um, shortly. That's a really amazing project. Um, and as you can see, uh, just gives rise to so many outcomes, positive outcomes, not only in terms of the carbon, but also it's a fantastic opportunity for, um, for delivering self-determined outcomes for Indigenous communities around healthy country. And uh, also the revenue from those projects is is invested firstly in the activity um, 
that is producing the carbon credits, whether that be savannah fire management or removing cattle from country or um, removing feral animals. And then um, also it, um, groups uh, invest that revenue in employment of Indigenous people on country in very remote areas where jobs are very scarce. Um, and then thirdly, though, the revenue that's, that is, is left over after that is also invested in community development projects and infrastructure and other things because government funding that uh, funds ranger groups is often tied, it's quite res quite restricted or constrained to a particular activity. So it really frees up groups to use that independent revenue however they choose um, because it is theirs. Um, so the the in terms of our what we're doing this year, the network will be uh, designing a marketing and branding strategy for the industry. And we're also about to publish a guide uh, on, to carbon projects for Indigenous organisations and a um, publisher report that is um, scoping the opportunities for carbon um, on the Indigenous estate. So that will be coming out in, in coming days. So just you know, just with the, the designer at the moment, um, which is the design phase has taken a little longer than we'd anticipated, but we're nearly there now. Uh, but there's substantial resources that um, uh, we've spent a lot of time developing. Uh, the carbon industry is very technical, so it can be very difficult to understand how to um, access that opportunity. And um, so, you know, it's just really important that we provide accessible information about it. Uh, we do have a little video that explains the role of the network. So um, I might hand over. Um, hand over to uh, Sean to roll the roll the video. If you have any questions, um, you can speak to me um, or you can go to our website, which is icin.org.au. And um, we've also got a another video for you today, um, which the Central Land Council have asked me to, um, to put on for you. They send their apologies. They have... Um, uh, they're busy out on country this week, um, so they're not able to be here. Um, and the rangers um, from Kalanjipa, which is Tennant Creek, um, a long way from here, uh, um, weren't able to come because they are busy out on country, um, managing country. So they've asked me to play their video, which is an 11-minute video um, that explains what they're doing on the country for their Savannah Fire Management Project. And then um, hand over to... Suzanne to talk more about the um, Yatra Dak um, project, carbon project in, on Inangai country. Thank you. The Indigenous Carbon Industry Network is a peak body for Indigenous-owned carbon projects across Australia. Its member organisations are doing world-recognised work to heal their country, generating over 1 million carbon credits per annum in recognition of the benefit their work brings to the climate, from managing the effects of hot savannah fires to reducing grazing pressure from cattle and feral animals, these carbon projects are Indigenous led and Indigenous owned and demonstrate the value of many thousands of years of traditional knowledge and cultural practices. The Indigenous Carbon Industry Network aims to empower and enable First Nations peoples to benefit from Australian carbon markets through knowledge sharing and access to independent and trusted sources of information. The role that ICIN is playing in this space is to really um, get the information out to our members and to others about your rights and interest in the carbon space, to be able to advocate on our behalf to the federal government, to work in partnership with the other land councils and other groups in this space, to really come up with the, the information and the correct information to make sure there is one voice and to really represent the voices of traditional owners and uh, Indigenous landholders um, within the space. Hi, my name is Dean Yubabu. I'm the chairman of Oregon Land Management. I'm a good one man. And I'm also a co-chair of ICIN. And I'm proud of launching the ICIN across Australia. Hello, my name is Catherine Brunet. I'm chairperson of one of our Corporation in the Kimberleys. We are proud members of the indigenous carbon industry. 
network because we were involved from the start uh, with our Savannah's journey. And also we work with other, uh, other groups to share knowledge and um, influence policy. Hello, I am Joe Martin Jard from the Northern Land Council based in the Northern Territory. The Northern Land Council is proud to be a member of ICIN Limited because it helps Aboriginal land managers to benefit from carbon markets and creates jobs for our people. We are Yugal Mangarayan. And, and we, we are, are proud, proud to be part of the Indian Good night, everybody. My name is Clive Nugrigalo. I'm a number one, from number one, number one ranges. Hi, my name is Preston Uramara. And we are the Numbula Nubrindi Rangers, and we are proud to be part of Indigenous Carbon Industry Network. Thank you. Together, we are working towards an Indigenous-led carbon industry across Australia, supporting the achievements and inherent responsibilities of First Nations peoples. Please join us at icin.org.au to find out more. On behalf of the Indigenous Carbon Industry Network, we'd like to dedicate this video in the memory of our founding director, the late Mr. W. Rioli. His profound love of country, the Tiwi Islands and his people will live on through his legacy. Thank you, and I, I sorry I realised that the reason I have slides is to remember all the bits and pieces that I need to say. And I did neglect to mention that uh, we have just um, launched as a uh, as a, a company, not for profit company, um, charitable company, uh, limited by guarantee, that's owned by our full members. So we're now um, just been on a journey of um, of creating uh, an independent body um, that will um, act. Uh, be a, a, effectively Australia's first um, peak body for the Indigenous carbon industry. Um, so we have a constitution that's found, uh, found with our members and we also um, have a, um, uh, some quite specific criteria for membership. Um, and so uh, the, uh, the, that, um, the evolution of that company, we've just transitioned to operational management um, through independently in the last two months um, so that's been um, a big journey and um, yeah we're um, proud to uh, give you a preview of this launch video that's still a work in progress but um, as we as we evolve uh, um, uh, we're really excited to to uh, launch the network as an independent body. Uh, I'll now um, introduce the Kalanchipa um, video from the Central Land Council um, this is about their Savannah Fire Management Project um, on a country which is uh, near Tennant Creek. On Kalantichpa North Aboriginal Land Trust, near the community of Malinja, west of Elliot in the Northern Territory, many people have gathered. There are Gurunji, Mudbara, Waramungu people, Indigenous ranger groups, and staff workers from Central Land Council. Uh, what brings me back here is um, we came here to do bushfire burning and to look after the land. Savannah burning has been going on for, for a few years now. In 2015, the federal government released a new methodology that increased the rainfall region to the 600 millimetre line, which actually made this patch of land, a very small patch of land in the very north of Kalantichpa North Aboriginal Land Trust, eligible to undertake Savannah burning. We've been, for the last two nights, we've been camping out here at Chinkachi Camp with the rangers from Bagarabu. 
and uh, changes from tenant free. We have everyone from the north coming to the Yes, traditionally. So some from tenant free, some that lives in tenant. So from Elliot and Molly, the so whole group all together. You know? We come with CLC um, every, just about every year in about winter time because that's the best time to do bushfire in winter time. I'm going to go to Uncle Kenny Creek. It's the best part of it. Like, um, I like to go to Bush to Burn. I can bring the Memphis along. Sometimes we have rangers from different different country to come help us out to do burning. The country is very remote and people rarely get the chance to visit and manage their land. Indigenous rangers from Dagaragu and Tennant Creek have travelled hundreds of kilometres to help and mentor traditional owners and young people in contemporary fire management techniques. Well, out here we got grass are building up now, and the growth of being burning it down, it's simply just makes it grow better as well for bush tuggers as well. And burning it where we burn, we know where it is, see? So this is the first time a savannah burning project has been uh, undertaken in the Central Land Council region. And when I started working up there in 2015, people wanted to get out in the country. They wanted to spend time with their family out on country so they could share knowledge, they could share stories, they could visit sites and find sites that haven't been visited for a very long time. Traditional owners and fire management staff carefully plan the trip's burns. We also got a chopper with us, flying out and helping us also do the burning from the top by air. This is the markers, turn that on, turn that on. This is where we put it to drop uh, 30 seconds and 30 is seconds. Yeah, this is the rain dance mach machine. This oh, is yeah, what gets so dropped good. down to make the fire. As small quiet fires were removed from the landscape when Aboriginal people were moved into communities, the unmanaged land has experienced large hot bushfires in the summer months. These fires caused the destruction of important habitat for animals such as bilbies, contributes to the spread of weeds and removes trees from the landscape. Western science has worked out that a fire regime of early dry season burning is beneficial to lowering greenhouse emissions and protecting biodiversity. So the process behind savannah burning and how that generates revenue is based in the fact that if we have large bushfires burning in summer, that creates a large output of greenhouse gases. And if we can change that fire regime by burning in the cooler months or what's called the early dry season, the fires will generally be a lot smaller and a lot cooler and therefore produce less carbon emissions. But it builds up with the carbon itself and all that, when it starts fire, it'll, it'll have wild bushfire out here, especially on country itself. They'll burn your country, wipe out, wipe out your country without knowing it. The difference between carbon produced by a large summer bushfire minus the carbon produced by smaller dry bushfires produces a carbon saving. This is purchased by the government as carbon credits and this monetary value is passed on to land managers. The government will pay people or pay what are Aboriginal corporations to go and burn at the right time of the year. So less of these gases are going into the atmosphere and therefore having a less of an impact on climate change. Bushfire when it up, carbon dioxide. 
I, I get the feedback from government give us we give them feedback from government and government give us more funding for this sort of project. Somebody invited the community and some money that we do boys for work with for English and back to the community more. I'm saving the change of the climate, I guess. Yeah. You don't have to have too much carbon dioxide going to the end. Less carbon dioxide, less climate change, I suppose. Learning how to burn country on time, on seasonal things, is giving back growth to the country itself. Traditional owners and their families are now able to self-fund this work and with the assistance of CLC continue to get people out to country they would usually have difficulty getting to and contribute to other land management work. Can we use cyber trap on this one? Can you write the group? Kangaroo, some sort of... One benefit of this project is it's a small contained project that will allow people to get training in governance, get an understanding of how to run a corporation, an understanding of how to manage finances, and also an understanding of a whole range of different land management work uh, other than the fire burning work. In the planning meetings, which we would conduct every year prior to burning with traditional owners about where they would like to visit and where they would like to burn, we discussed that they would need to set up a Aboriginal corporation separate from the CLC. And then that corporation would actually have to get a lease, which allowed them to undertake land management and firework on this specific uh, part of the land. So I got into it and Cheryl was asking me to be a chairperson. So I did. Mm. I was excited. Like carbon burning is new to have many people. The idea of it of carbon burning, everybody was more excited and we got a lot of details coming. There's a couple of really great things that are gonna come out of this project. Firstly, it gets people out on the country in a region where there has not been any way of getting out of the country for an, for a very long time. And the other great thing about this project is it's self-sufficient. So there is no more funding required from the Central Land Council or from any other grants other than the money generated from undertaking the Savannah burning work. Uh, uh, I miss a TO, it's coming back. It puts the spirit back in, into, um, into me and feels good in the heart, you know, and in the body, in the mind, open your mind up. That builds, builds up you individually, who you are, being an Aboriginal as well. I like to say to the young generation now, get up. This is your opportunity to come back to your country and look after your country itself. Thank you, um, and thank you very much. So I'd like to um, uh, just just um, introduce Susanna now, if you're um, standing by, Susanna. Um, but um, before I do, just to sort of make a note that that video was created a couple of years ago, and there was um, a little bit of talk about the government build, buying the carbon credits. Um, but the market for the Indigenous carbon credits now is predominantly um, corporate buyers who are voluntarily offsetting their, their pollution. Um, and so those corporate buyers will pay a premium 
price for Indigenous carbon credits. So that has um, uh, meant that now groups get a much higher price than they used to. Um, the price they used to get through the government, um, uh, through the um, reverse auction, through the emissions reduction scheme um, was around $16. But now um, the uh, spot price on the voluntary market is um, currently around $30 a tonne. So it's um, at least double, um, sometimes triple what people were getting in the past through um, the, the emissions reduction fund, which is the Australian government purchasing the credits. So the corporate um, voluntary um, market offers um, more opportunities for groups to generate mm. revenue from their projects. So that's um, also very exciting. Um, is, is Suzanne? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Hi, Suzanne. I think I might need the volume up a little bit on Suzanne. Hello, can you hear me? How's yeah, that? Yeah, we can, we can hear you coming through loud and clear, Suzanne. Uh, Suzanne's right. dialing in from Inningai country in central Queensland. Um, and um, as you've heard, she's an incredible um, uh, woman, Indigenous leader, and um, has, a, has um, generated so many exciting projects on her country. Uh, one of them is, is the, their carbon project. So I'll hand over to Suzanne to talk a little bit about that before we... Um, you hand, um, introduce that, uh, the Napaji Napaji video. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so for me, hi, everybody. How are you going? Um, so, yeah, Inangai country and out back central Queensland, out um, about an hour and a half out of Bark Alden, so on a very remote um, ex-cattle station. Um, but firstly, I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge um, all of our ancestors that walked this awesome country of ours before us, and also acknowledge those um, whose lands have been taken away from them and hope and pray that one day um, through this process that we will all have the opportunity to uh, be back on country and heal our country as our, our law um, governed us um, for many millennia prior to um, colonization. Um, and what I'll do is I'll start with um, my slides, my video. So I've prepared a slide. Sometimes it's probably better for me to do slides because um, there's so much to talk about. So you can see here that this is the land um, of the Inungai people where we're situated in central Western Queensland. So let me begin, who are we? So Yambaka, which is on country in our language, the Inungai language, Aboriginal cultural heritage. So that's our most important asset to us as um, as, as people um, and Tourism Development Aboriginal Corporation. So we've shortened that to Yachadak and, um, and established ourselves back in 2015. This process, I suppose, seen myself um, through my ancestors uh, visiting me in a dream and telling me it was time to come home. So we neighbour um, our Jungalingu, Wangan Jungalingu people and the Gullalee Basin is um is right next door we're part of that Gullalee Basin so it's resource capital in Queensland we're um, being impacted by potential fracking um as well as the coal mines and whatnot that's situ uh, situated um just off the edge of our country and our country also is the beginning of the watershed into the Lake Air Basin system so where we're situated on the property is what they call the beginning of that uh watershed area um the direction and what we talk about as an organisation and what we looked at is to land, to restore our land and also to look at how we harvest off country and how we also provide what we call a tourism experience, which we call guesting on country. Um, so part of, uh, in we were afforded the opportunity um, back in 2019, 2018, successful with the Queensland Government's Land Restoration Project pilot. Um, a very first Indigenous organisation to be able to get that up. And also the, pro the methodology or the carbon project is what they call human-induced, HIR. Um, uh, um, so as you can see in the picture behind, the property was very much cleared, mechanically cleared, annihilated with true Sorry, grass. Sorry, Suzanne, uh, we can't see your slides. Are you able to press the share screen? Oh, um, okay. Let me go back. That's what I didn't do. Sorry, guys. I'll do that. I just went straight in. Is that better? Beautiful. Thank you. I wondered why it sort of was. All right. So there's in and go. I'll start again. So you can all see that. Sorry, guys. 
So this is in Ngai country, central western Queensland. I suppose one of the things that I missed out in saying in that too is that where our land and property are situated is the edge of the ancient inland sea. And when we look at a dating period and time of that, uh, we're on the side of the rivers and swamps um, uh, in that period of time. So who we are, um, you can see this is who we are. Um, and we're made up of many of um, our family members um, and different mobs across um, our community um, as well. And we partner, which you'll see shortly, with um, a great uncle um, uh, and great leader from um, your way, Uncle Vincent Forrester. Um, so the direction of the land restoration and harvesting of country and also our guesting on country, as I was explaining before, which is what we call tourism. Um, and I think that's one of the challenges that we find um, when we're asked to deliver tourism is that uh, we're more than a product and we're sharing something of great value. And that's our knowledge of country and story. So I think when we enter into anybody's space to learn and share those stories, we come in as guests. So we looked at that as um, and seen that as a guesting on country. So this is where you can see, sorry, the, the, the land clearing in behind. And so the property is um, 8,861 hectares. <laughs> And we always have dogs. <laughs> Sorry. Um, out in the property, there's probably something coming in. So um, also, so it's 22 and a half thousand acres. What's situated here? So we're really lucky that the Indigenous Land and Sea Corporation, the Isle of Sea, acquired our property for us. Um, and it was also in particular to... Uh, protect and to maintain uh, one of a very significant cultural heritage site on the property, um, which we've locked up as a cultural nature reserve precinct area. That site houses the whole Seven Sisters uh, Jukupa story, um, our old law story. Um, as you can see here, that's 2022. That's what we're currently looking at. Um, I took that photograph this morning. So, but prior to that in 2019, you'll see here um, what the country looked like after it had been mechanically cleared. Uh, part of our HIR project is also around the, uh, to do uh, grazing cattle management, rotational grazing and reducing the paddocks, which I'll share through um, that process. So lots of pictures to show. Part of it also was also to improve the water um, on the property. So if we wanted to minimize the paddocks, uh, we have no cattle background. All we know and what we offer and how we came to this project was utilising our cultural knowledge and understanding of country. Um, and so, of course, it was all learning. So we had two bores put in because uh, we knew that the current water system didn't work well for us. And then, of course, then the laying of poly pipe across. So we've looked at laying, I think we've laid something like 20 kilometres of poly pipe so far to move waters around the property and also make sure that we're designing um, and looking after the cattle that we're adjusting at the moment so that they're still not destroying country, but they're also um, the, in the way that we design where the water points are, um, that they're making channels for us that also look at how we might drought proof our property. So uh, there's many, I, I suppose, when we look at country and we look through our Aboriginal lens, we see country very differently. And I think we respond to it um, accordingly um, as our ancestral whispers would guide us. And so then also in, you know, the materials in doing fencing, putting in the fence breaks, fencing lines, um, all up, we've got uh, 22 and a half, uh, 22 kilometers of new fencing to put in. We've just um, put in 10 kilometers and we're just about to instate some more and that meant fencing and stuff. So this has provided great employment opportunities um, for our local young people um, and also um, a lot of the sort of older cousins that have retired an opportunity for them to come back home to country and to share country and also to look at how we nurture country up. Part of it also then we also do carbon so to protect our carbon paddocks then it was imperative because we know we had a wildfire that had come through this country back in uh, uh, I think about 15 years ago nearly 20 years ago so it's the way country responds back after wildfires is not necessarily what we want. 
um, and because dominant uh, tree species and plant species come back in, the grasses and whatnot. So we started to then, which was country prior to burning, and started to look at then we um, involved and invited down Victor Stefferson and hosted a workshop on country. And you can see there where we did some of the burning across country. Um, and then also that particular burn, what we do out here. So we're the what we call the desert uplands region. And so it's a quite a unique bioregion. And we tend to go, yes, winter is the best time to burn. But if we get 30 mil of rain because of that sandy country and we know that the moisture is held within um, the, the uh, soil and it holds there for quite some time and to the right depth that we pretty much go out and burn. So our, our local uh, fire warden has learnt now that we, we tend not to, we're always sort of challenging the space because we really want to be able to uh, lead in our knowledge of managing country and how we manage country. So we're sometimes, you know, a permit doesn't suit us because we can't predict when it's going to rain. Um, and so we're responding to what the climate is providing us and how we manage country. And then also then putting in more of those fire breaks and things that I talked about um, up through. Um, and you can see that uh, this sect, this one here that we've actually, so we've put in a fire break right along the escarpment. So we have five kilometers of escarpment and five kilometers of rock art story walls through this particular area. So we need to protect our cultural heritage sites as well. Um, first and more so, um, foremost. And we also have seven springs on the property. And part of that is also um, how we will look at restoring country and the springs um, which have been dammed up um, over time. And there'll be a video that I'll show shortly. But this water hole, we would call that our Mundagara, our rainbow serpent water hole. And I was brought up um, always knowing that. And because we hadn't had access to country to care for country, once colonisation um, came and also uh, the many massacres that happened for my people through this country meant that we weren't and weren't afforded the opportunity to come back and care for our country. So we did a project, which you'll see soon, and it's like what Uncle Vincent Forrester has taught us and also the younger generations is Nupachi Nupachi, give, you give back. And so you know, we cleaned out a water hole, which will be shown in the video shortly. Um, and then planted grasses around that water hole and watered that then over a period of um, a w uh, just over a week. And we released, uh, we were still in drought at that particular point in time. And uh, so there was no water anywhere for the animals other than the springs and having to go such a long way away. And so 2000 litres of water a day, we went down and watered um, because it's our garden and watered that. And um, on the last day of sort of watering, it wasn't necessarily last day, but once it started to hold water um, and, and left a puddle overnight, because each time we went down, we noticed different animal tracks coming through. So we knew that our native animals were starting to respond to the moisture and the smell of um, water in their area um, because of the, the very long drought that we're in. So that next morning we came down and there was a koala in the tree and I know for um, Uncle Vincent that it was uh, quite a significant moment for him um, and we really celebrated that and then not long after that then um, you can see down the bottom here then the animals and whatnot came but the water um, and we broke the drought and the rain started to flow for us and it hasn't stopped. So these animals are all on our property um, and they've all showed themselves koalas in trees and forks of trees I think for us, though, what we're excited about is having the opportunity to be back on country. I believe that our ancestors and um, all of our animals and plants know that and respond accordingly because we were um, the protectors of, um, you know, these very things that keep us alive as human beings um, and our responsibility under our, our moiety systems as well. Um, and then, of course, the co-benefits that come with that and VIP workshops. We've had archaeologists come out because of the story wall and the work that we do around that. We've had various ministers come to visit to share our story. And also we share our story through the guesting on country um, with school groups and do sun 
rise up on top of the escarpment so that they can um, see that, um, you know, beautiful country and also see the work that we've done out there for improvement of country and learning about their region, especially for our local um, schools in the region. For the young people, I think it's exciting them that they have an opportunity to come out and to really um, immerse themselves in some scientific and cultural activities. Um, and then, of course, the co-benefits and where, so the ILSC just acknowledging in the Carbon Market Institute and we're members of the Indigenous Carbon um, Network. And that, I suppose, has, a, and I want to talk about the opportunity and what we've been able to identify as carbon farmers and Indigenous carbon farmers is what would make us unique um, in regards to the rest of the market. And I keep bannering around in the um, IC, Indigenous um, Carbon Network are actually supporting us to develop their carbon um, around the rainbow carbon um, idea and what values sit under that to be eligible for a rainbow carbon credit. Because um, not only are we doing brown carbon, uh, khaki carbon, um, if we're restoring springs, we're also about to look at putting in a native foods nursery under our harvesting initiative. And so what are the canopy trees that perhaps we might put in there, the income that we can create, and also through seed harvesting and providing uh, opportunity for re-veg projects and, and for the like, as well as the cultural no, transfer of cultural knowledge and, and the building and strengthening strength for that, um, as well as the endangered species. Um, and the different sort of flora and fauna. So for us, we know that there's a whole range of different um, opportunities that if and what we do as practitioners and cultural practitioners of land um, needs to have a, 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 a good value placed on it. So I don't think it's just one method that we do as Indigenous landholders. Being the, the oldest um, land carers, I think, on the planet um, and it's maintained and continued um, for that period of time. So in saying that now, I think it's over to you guys to put on the video for me, I think. Um, you've got the link there. Thank you, Auntie Sue. Okay, thank you. But what does it mean? Caring for country. If all you black fellas out there in your country, you say you're black fella, go and identify a rock hole that you clean out, help that environment a little bit. Because you're caring for the country, you're caring for the animal too, eh? You call that Napachi, Napachi. Napachi, Napachi. Napachi, Napachi. You give me, I'll give you. Well, these young men, they came to a place called Gracefell Station and they helped maintain a rock hole. Never make fire inside the rock hole. Yeah. You make it out. Okay. About 80 months ago, traditional owners belonging to this country, they cleaned out that rock hole. And the country started talking to us straight away. Oh, oh. It's very um, grounding, you know, it shows that, you know, wait a second, this, this is actually something that can make a difference, not only in our neighbour's country, uh, but also in our own country and also in your own country, wherever you're from. Even in the last few days that we've been putting water in this water hole, we've seen more animals come by here. I've never felt closer to, to country than I have in the last couple of weeks. It's, it's amazing. This experience has taught me the value of caring for country, the real value of why you should care for country as not only just an Indigenous person, but anybody that lives in this country because it's a collective thought amongst us all, that we all have a sacred place that connects us through the water. Water travels all around this country, all around this continent. So, you know, it's, it's what brings us all together. Water hole like your heart and your heart's got a beat. And then the waterways and the way they go out and across the country are the veins and the arteries Lung. that feed this living organism that's out there that, that feeds us. And so if our heart is clogged up and dried up and silted up and can't breathe the water and the veins can't breathe, so country's sick. Big country.
So could you imagine if each mob cleaned out one rock hole? Sacred site is a garden, your place of worship. That's where you've got to look after it. Ngapachi, ngapachi. Ngapachi, ngapachi.